beautiful. I'm sure that you like this uh, short uh, video. Uh, it is, now you know uh, how you can show recognition, gratitude, respect to those who work hard to produce the food that we eat every day. Uh, it is my uh, great pleasure and my uh, great honor to introduce you now to the next keynote speaker. It is Eleanor Starmer, National Coordinator and Advisor for Local and Regional Food Systems at USDA. She coordinates the department's efforts to strengthen local and regional food systems. She leads the Know Your Farmer, Know Your Food initiative. Originally from a small farming community in New Hampshire, Eleanor brings together a wealth of knowledge and expertise working on agriculture, nutrition, food and development policy issues. Her keynote speech will focus on family farming in the US. Please give a warm welcome to Eleanor Stammer. Thank you. Thank you so much, Barbara, and thanks to the rest of the FAO leadership and to the National Geographic um, leadership for putting together this fabulous event, and to all of you who made it out in the rain to join us today. Um, I've been asked to say a couple opening words uh, about the state of family farming in the United States, and I have to say that that is definitely not an easy task. Um, as I believe someone on the previous panel might have mentioned, family farms in the United States comprise about 90% of all farms that we have here. They produce the vast majority of our food and they're critical to our food security as a nation. Um, so that's what I can say about them as a group. Uh, but family farms in the US are certainly not monolithic. And so as we dig down and look at who these families are, where they're growing and what they're growing, it becomes very difficult to make any sort of universal summarizing statements, except to say that they are very diverse. Um, and that diversity is certainly uh, a great, great strength and will be one of the themes of my, my opening remarks today. Um, this spring, USDA released the results of our 2012 agricultural census. And that census had some good and some bad news uh, in terms of the state of family farming here in the US. We've lost farmland in this country at a rate that is far higher than acceptable. Um, but the good news is that that rate is slowing, uh, I believe, as more people find opportunity in agriculture. We continue to lose mid-sized farms in this country while we're seeing um, growth in larger and smaller farms. Our rural population has declined in absolute terms for the first time in history, uh, not just as a percentage of overall population, but as a raw number, we're seeing fewer folks in our rural areas, and that's a great concern for us uh, as a department, and I believe for all of us as a country. Um, and our farm population is continuing to age. For every farmer under the age of 35 in this country, we have six over the age of 65. And the average age of the farmer, as we determined in our last census, was almost 60 years old. Um, and that is, is another concern um, for us as a department and for us as a country. These are some of the challenges that we face along with the very significant challenge um, of climate change, which is really a backdrop underpinning many of the discussions we're having here today. But there is also some good news in the census, and it gets back to this theme of diversity. Um, although the overall number of farms is down across the US, and I suppose that's not a surprise given the drought and um, some of the economic impacts um, earlier on as we were gathering this census data, we did see increase in increases in the number of farmers between the ages of 24 and 35. We still have a long way to go when it comes to bringing more young people into agriculture, but this uh, trend is very, very heartening. The number of Hispanic and Asian farmers in the US both increased by 21% between 2007 when our last census was released and 2012. Um, and those farmers tend to be slightly younger on average than other farmers, again, very good news. The number of Native Amer American farmers in the US increased by 10% over that same period, and the number of African American farmers increased by 12%. So we're seeing a much greater diversity in terms of who is farming here. Um, and those folks are the folks who will be farming in the future. Um, so we're looking at a much more diverse face of farming um, going into um, later in the century. We're also seeing greater geographic diversity. Where are people growing food? Um, there was, 
an overall decline, as I mentioned, in the number of farms, but there were 16 states that had increases in the number of farms and 19 states that actually had increases in the amount of farmland being farmed. And those states were not the usual suspects. Um, so we're looking outside of the Corn Belt in the Midwest. Um, we're looking at less conventional places for growing food. We're looking at urban areas. Um, these are all interesting trends and, um, and hopeful trends as we look at um, a greater diversity of food production nationwide. Um, and we're seeing a much greater diversity of markets, what people are selling and um, what they're producing on the farm. The number of farms producing renewable energy in the US more than doubled between 2007 and 2012. The number of folks who are engaged in local and regional food systems growing uh, products that they're marketing to their local communities was up very significantly. Um, we saw more farms being engaged in value-added production and agritourism, and I know we'll hear from um, some farmers on the next panel about exactly what this looks like on the ground. Um, but that's all, that's all very encouraging. When I joined uh, the administration three years ago, it was to build on these trends and to help ensure that our institutions are innovating to serve the diversity of family farms in the United States um, and helping to bring new people into agriculture. This is a really critical mission as we look at things like climate change. Um, because as any good investor will tell you, there is security in a diversified portfolio. And that's the case uh, on an individual farm at the ground level, as well as for the industry as a whole. Um, farmers know this. Uh, our data show that they are, as I mentioned, diversifying and, and innovating at the farm level. Um, but our institutions need to be there to meet them. And that's uh, really the challenge that, that I'm engaged in, along with many, many others at the US Department of Agriculture. Um, so at USDA, we have been taking a hard look at what we can do in our own programs um, with or without congressional approval. There's a lot that we can do that does not depend on Congress. There's a lot that we need congressional approval to do. Um, but looking at ways that we can help make our own programs work better for new farmers, for highly diversified farmers, um, for those marketing products locally. How can our research agencies, and I should mention, we're a massive institution. We have 17 different agencies. We have around 110,000 employees nationwide. Um, so we have a lot of tools in the toolbox to be able to engage on these challenges. Um, we're looking at how can our research agencies be working on new crop mixes for diversified farms, new production systems um, to help them become more efficient. We're looking at how we can expand access to our credit program which is so critical for a viable farm business um, for those folks who are more diversified or who are new to farming. Um, we developed one tool that we, that we rolled out uh, just at the beginning of 2013 was we developed a new microloan program, um, which is smaller loans of up to $35,000 um, that are available with a much easier application process, um, more streamlined and efficient application process, and really targeted to those small and mid-sized farmers um, who maybe don't need $300,000, um, but need something to, to help their businesses. And we've made over 8,400 of those microloans just since early early 2013. Um, and we've made other changes to our credit programs to help increase access. If you are a highly diversified farmer and you're growing 50 different crops and rotating them three times a year, and you look at our form and it asks you what your acreage yield and price is for every single one of those crops, you're probably not gonna take out a loan. <laughs> um, but we have ways that we are uh, innovating to produce right now that will allow those farmers to value their crop production in different ways than we have traditionally um, valued them and allow us to really assess the farm business and make those loans. And that's just one example of ways in which we're expanding access to our credit programs. Um, thanks to the Farm Bill uh, that was just passed earlier in 2014, we've been able to make historic levels of investment in local and regional food systems. Um, opportunities for new farmers to get into the business by starting up on a small plot of land and selling locally, opportunities for long-standing farmers of all sizes to diversify um, and start selling into some of these higher value markets. Our research shows that local food systems keep revenue in the local community and act as an economic driver, um, not just for those farms, but for all the supply chain businesses um, engaged there. And so we really see investment in things like smaller scale processing, um, aggregation through food hubs, innovative regional distribution networks um, to, be, to be well worth the investment um, and really have economic impacts on the ground. 
We're also looking at how local and regional food systems can be a tool to reach underserved communities, um, getting back to some of the nutrition issues that were discussed in the earlier panel. Um, one uh, example of the work that we've done here is looking at how we can expand access uh, among folks who are using SNAP, otherwise known as food stamps, um, or WIC or other nutrition benefits who want to shop at farmers markets. Um, just in the last, uh, since 2009, we have seen a 500% increase in the number of farmers markets that accept these benefits. Um, and we're looking at 20 to $25 million a year of funds um, th redeemed through SNAP um, at farmers markets. That's just one example, but it's, it's a very exciting trend. As I mentioned, we are a very large institution, and so to do this effectively, it really requires coordination. Um, and so another way in which we have innovated uh, is in 2009, we launched the Know Your Farmer, Know Your Food initiative. And that's really an attempt to take uh, people from across USDA, from all of these 17 agencies, and bring them together to discuss how our programs can work more effectively together, how we can be more responsive to the things that we are hearing from stakeholders on the ground, from the folks who come knocking at our doors saying, I'm doing things a little differently and I need you to, to meet me where I am. Um, and we have met regularly since 2009 um, to have these discussions, to take in this input, and to make very tangible changes to our programs, just a few of which I've, I've already mentioned today. Um, Stepping back, though, away from the local regional piece and looking at family farmers more broadly, I would say the last thing I'd like to touch on is just um, helping agriculture be part of the solution to the challenge of climate change as well as adapt to the pressures of climate change. Um, we recently announced regional climate hubs that are gathering knowledge and information and disseminating it to farmers on the ground. Um, we're working with producers to implement solar energy, geothermal, wind, um, biofuels at an accelerating pace. We're implementing conservation practices uh, on their land and helping them steward those resources that are so um, that we all depend on. Um, and I think again, another example of innovation in government is that we see our climate work, our local and regional foods work, and our new farmer work all being coordinated by. Um, task forces that encompass people from all across USDA. So again, we're thinking as an institution, how can we take all of the tools in our toolbox and bring them to bear on these, on these very significant challenges? And we're recognizing that it is not simply enough to reach out to these producers and businesses. We actually need to make sure that our programs work for them when they come to our doors. And luckily, the Farm Bill has provided us with um, significant new tools to do this work, and that's, that's very exciting. Um, as I mentioned, historic levels of support for beginning farmers, for local and regional food systems, um, and, and other important programs. So I'm hopeful, looking forward, that this work is going to bear fruit. Uh, it won't just be that we have more young people coming into agriculture, although that's certainly a goal. It won't just be increased economic activity from local food systems. It won't just be more farms generating their own energy and, sell and, and um, using it themselves and providing it back to the grid um, or reducing their greenhouse gas emissions. This work is really helping bridge a divide that I think has traditionally existed or at least appeared to exist between our rural communities and our urban communities. Um, very few people farm in the United States. It's about 1% of our population at this point, And very few people have ever set foot on a farm. Um, but the work that we are all doing is helping to connect rural and urban communities in a way that I think helps us all recognize the interdependence of those two areas and the importance of thinking regionally and looking at our assets at a, at a regional scale. Um, and, and the extent to which we rely on each other when it comes to food security, uh, energy security, and the ability to adapt to and mitigate climate change. And that work is also going to have huge implications for our economy. Uh, there was a report released by uh, OECD about a year or so ago, I believe, that found that worldwide, integrating rural and urban assets was key to socioeconomic performance. So on average, the places they found where rural and urban were more integrated performed better in terms of GDP than the places where they were less integrated. Um, and so again, I think economic implications on top of everything else makes this work so very critical. None of this is going to be easy. Um, it will take significant innovation by farmers and by businesses and by government and by um, all of the stakeholders involved in our communities to, to um, make this work. But the trends have me feeling heartened. 
um, I think the diversity of family farms in the United States, where and what they are growing, who is producing our food, the, great, the greater interest that we're seeing in agriculture among young people. Um, these are the best tools that we have as we face down some of these very significant future challenges. So I'm looking forward to the thoughts of our esteemed panel, and I'm grateful to be able to join the panel for some additional remarks. And I thank you all for joining us today. Thank you very much.